Good morning, good evening, depending upon what part of the world you're in. If it's Friday, it is the CEO series where we bring together global leaders, entrepreneurs, and disruptors from across the globe. Our guest today is Devon Warren. Our topic is the career twist from educator to global photographer. He started his career as an educator and rose to become director of guidance at a, a private school in New Jersey, USA. He eventually left that role to become a counselor at a school of emotionally disturbed uh, young people. He experienced emotional burnout. He decided to pursue his side hustle as a recording engineer and eventually opened a recording studio. After developing a love and passion for photography, he transitioned to the photography business. He is now an award-winning portrait and product photographer in the New York metropolitan area, serving a full spectrum from product to portrait and events. And with that introduction, I want to welcome my guest today, Devon Warren. Devon, how are you? Great, great. I'm Thank you for having me. That was the best introduction I've ever had. <laughs> oh, thank you so much for that. Yeah, that was it was amazing. It, thank you. Yeah, it was it was amazing. Let me give, give the audience some background. Uh, Devon did my headshots, and a lot of you have seen it online. And I think I've got more likes on a portrait than I've ever received before. You know, as a result of that, and doing that photo shoot as we were talking. He told a story about how he got into photography. I thought it was so unique, and here's why. Because so many of us go through burnout. We go through different challenges we're facing on a job. But in a lot of cases, we stay there. And he went through three transitions to get to where he is now. So I'm, I'm going to start out uh, you know, asking a question around that. Three careers before you found your sweet spot as a photographer. Walk us through that transition. Um, so, uh, I, I think my first career was my comfort zone. Um, I went back to my high school, um, to teach and I was teaching there in the summer doing a summer program. So it was a natural progression just to go there to teach. And I taught English for one year and then the director of guidance left and they offered me the position. Um, they thought it would be good because I was young. I had just gone through the process of, um, the college, the whole college process. So they thought it would be a good fit for me. Um, did that for five years, um, then transitioned to another school for a mostly disturbed kids. And they told me when I started that job that I would experience burnout in about five years. That was the burnout of the job. And I lasted exactly five years. Um, so during that time, I had, you know, typical side hustle. I started to dibble and dabble in music. Um, and that was around the early 2000s. And that was the birth of the um, the home studio where a lot of people were okay. moving away from larger commercial studios. And a lot of this had to do with just technology getting better. Computers got faster. Um, so a lot of things were computer-based. So you were able to um, set up recording studios in your home that were, you know, you didn't need the thousands and thousands of dollars that you needed before. So I had a small recording studio in my apartment. And it was a good side hustle. So when I got burned out, um, I decided to just take a leap of faith and try that full time. Okay. Um, so I was running a recording studio basically out of my apartment and then got the opportunity to open a commercial space. Um, and a, me and a friend of mine who also opened the studio at the same time, we basically, you know, kind of went in blind, <laughs> we're googling things and basically yeah. built recording studios out of this raw commercial space yeah and um did that for a while and similar to the story you were telling me about your son my wife got an opportunity to move to atlanta mm -hmm. so during that time um i started to i would say dibble and dabble in photography mm -hmm. and you know the music business you know atlanta is a hot spot for music so i um when I was transitioning down to Atlanta, I was very excited about going down there and considering um, after selling the studio up here in New Jersey, I was excited about going to Atlanta and exploring the music business down there because I felt like, you know, you have New York and you have Atlanta, you have Miami, you have California. So I was going to another hotspot for music. And when I got there, basically nobody returned my phone calls. <laughs> so welcome, it was kind of like, you yeah, know, we you to, to Atlanta. 
<laughs> yeah. When you get to Atlanta, call this guy. This is my friend. This is my I called everybody and nobody called me back. Yeah. Um, but I um met a few people who needed photography. So I started doing photography and that started to pick up. And I slowly started to realize that, man, I really enjoy this. And one thing about photography is I um I really understand it. Um, it's something that um I'm not going to say that's a natural talent, but I, I take in the information and I understand a lot of different aspects of photography and lighting and it comes, it comes pretty uh, easily to me. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's something that gelled with me really, um, really nicely and really easily and mm. different from the music, uh, doing music and being in the studio. It was cool because, you know, my kids were younger. I could take them to work with me. You know, okay. they could come yeah. hang out with me. It was yeah. always an environment where I could have yeah. my my family around me. So it was a much better um, work life because um, my son was maybe two years old, three years old when I started doing this. But okay. he could always tag along as long as he could sit down and play with something. You okay. know, the environment was always a little better. Yeah. yeah. So um, Atlanta didn't work out. We moved back to New Jersey um, mm -hmm. and I ended up opening a um partnering with a friend and opening a commercial um photo studio from there and haven't looked back since wow that's that's amazing so you you know you talked about that point of burnout you said they told you five years and you know when you said it i thought of what if we got j jobs and we were interviewing for a job and we got the job and i said okay let me let me advise you you're going to be burned out in about three to five years mm -hmm. they don't tell us that but that really happens in a lot of cases but we don't make the move to try and do better. Right. So how, how would you advise someone who reaches that point and they know they're experiencing something to take the next step? You know, we talked about that next step, that blind next step. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and it doesn't always have to be a blind next step. You just have to be honest with yourself. And, okay. um, you know, I think you can do like, I think the good thing now is that there's so much information Like you can, literally Google and find out information about everything. Mm. So you can find out all aspects of anything that you're looking to do differently. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of data. There's a lot of information that you can just find out. So you don't have to take a, like a kind of a blind leap of faith. You can definitely transition into something different. Um, but you definitely have to be a little bit comfortable being uncomfortable. Um, and I think that's what we, that's the biggest thing. And I think, um, my, my wife always applauds me that for that because yeah. I'm comfortable being uncomfortable and I'm oh, comfortable wow. when, um, you know, things aren't going right and you have to make a transition. So, you know, when the pandemic hit, it was kind of like, okay, this is just something else that I have to figure out, mm. you know? And I think that's the thing. Don't be afraid to figure things out. Um, and I think that's why people stay in jobs where they're burnt out because they don't have to figure it out. I just got to show up every day. <laughs> yeah. You know? and, just go, and go through the motions. Yeah. Go through the motions. And I think that's the thing. Don't be afraid to figure it out because there's an answer out there. There's a solution uh -huh. out there. Um, give yourself the time to figure it out um, and sit down. Cause I think that's the other thing with jobs and burnout. You spend so much time in a job. You don't have anything else to do. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't have that time to sit, and be quiet and figure out things because, you know, when you have time to pause and you have time to think, that's when the answers come to you. Yeah. But when you're sitting there going through, you know, what we call the rat race, it's just in the routine. That's they tell me about it. I love the phrase comfortable being uncomfortable. I got to mm -hmm. use that. I'll send you the royalty check. Every time <laughs> I use it. But I love that comfortable yeah. being uncomfortable because some people, are struggling and they're not comfortable in that zone and you know it, like we talked before we went live of uh, you know people that said they want to do this they mm -hmm. are going to do this and you see them a year later and they're still talking the same thing so yeah. when are you going to make the step to do what you said you were going to do yeah I, I think it's um I think Steve Harvey said it like you you have to jump like eventually you just have to jump and you have to start whether you're starting big or you have to start small, like you have to start and you have to keep going. Yeah. You know, it's just one of those things where it, it's um, it's like going to the gym, like you're not going to get in shape if you don't start, you know, you have yeah. to start somewhere, whether it's 
15 minutes a day, 20 yeah. minutes a day. Like you have to start yeah. and keep building on that. Yeah. You mentioned the gym. There was always a, cause I'm kind of a gym person. And so the gym people that's always there. Well, always notice in January, the gym. Oh, it's full. packed. Yep. <laughs> it's January, packed. February, and we'd always mm-hmm. look at each other. All we got to do is wait a couple of months and they'll all be gone. Because <laughs> that's the premise of, of gym memberships. You know? Yep. Mm-hmm. The New Year's resolution. <laughs> New Year's resolution. My mother <laughs> always it. said, a phrase that I always remembered that she said, the journey of a thousand miles starts with one step. One step. So we're talking mm-hmm. about getting off the curb and making that step, even mm-hmm. when you can't figure out all of it to move forward Mm -hmm. but there's still that hesitation there to do that so when you decided to try the recording business not having having a background in it and and you Mm -hmm. just like okay what do i even the tools you would use for that Mm -hmm. i look at these keyboards in these studios sometimes and i'm like how do you know which button to do yeah um insights on that yeah so i used to um I had a math teacher when I was in high school and he used to always harp on all the people throughout history who was self-educated and he would run down a list of Malcolm X and all these people who were self-educated. And, you know, one thing I learned is that you have to be a lifelong learner mm. and there's always something else to learn. So, and everything that you're going to, I think school kind of gives you the tools to l- learn how to learn. But you have to be able to self-educate. And I think that's where um, I've been able to win is figuring out where to get the information, where's the best place to get the information and sifting out the stuff that I don't need and Mm -hmm. doubling down on the stuff that I do need to um, figure out. And, you know, I just learned stuff slowly but surely on the, you know, on the side Mm -hmm. by reading. Um, The internet wasn't as big um, with information when I started, um, you know, back then, but (laughs) Now I, I call it YouTube university. Like you can go on YouTube and literally learn pretty much anything. Like people are sharing all the information. Mm, I mean, yeah. there's, you know, the college lectures on, on YouTube that you can, you can go in here. So the information is no longer, um, I kind of think it's no longer an excuse. I mean, there's some tidbits that you probably won't be able to get until you enter into the industry because it's just from experience, but, yeah. um, yeah, the 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 music deciding to go into um, you know a recording studio business was totally a lethal faith, and I think yeah. my ego had more to do to it than anything. I was like, oh, I can yeah. do this. Like, uh, yeah, you know? I can figure it out. You know, I so, yeah, it, yeah. it was a certain <laughs> level of ego and cockiness, and you know, yeah. maybe if I was more educated on it, I might have scared myself out of yeah. um, not doing it. Yeah. But I think you um, sometimes ignorance is bliss. You kind of go in and you you figure yeah. out, yeah, yeah, I can do this, and you know you make a way as you're going through it. Yeah, ignorance is bliss. You know, you that's a that's a very profound statement because some a lot of industries today, if we stood back and if they would have felt that can't do that, you wouldn't have had it around. And they just right. went into it and they learned as, as they went along. The other key point that you mentioned was being a lifelong learner. I read an article about, you know, Warren Buffett and all these, you know, these so-called billionaires and how much time they spend each day carving out time to read, to, mm-hmm. to self-educate, lifelong learner, the same concept you're talking about. Yeah, I think, um, and the same thing still with photography, I think, um, and I teach other people photography and I'm still learning. You know, I think it's just one of those things where you you never, I think when you figure out, when you, the more you learn, you figure out how much you don't know, yeah, <laughs> you yeah, know? So there's yeah, always yeah, a new thing. Yeah. There's always something different, another aspect, another way to look at it. And it's something that, um, you know, it's a journey for me to master photography. So, mm. you know, I'll continue to learn as I go along. And I think there's all, you know, just being okay like you don't know it all. So it's, it's a cool thing to just um, keep studying, keep learning, you know, mm. keep it fresh, you know? Okay. We have a guest from uh, Australia, Rowena, uh, or I said that I used to, I use that too, getting comfortable being uncomfortable, very dear mm-hmm. friend of mine who's now in Australia. So we have, Hey, Rowena, we'll talk later. She's going to be an upcoming guest soon. Awesome. Um, you, you know, you mentioned the uh, learning. I was I did a, a session this morning out of Singapore. I just got off a little while ago. And I was telling the people on the call 
about the importance of what we're talking about. And I showed them this. This is my reading material for the weekend. And almost every weekend I have this and I just curl up and I read it, I mark it up, and I continue to do that. And I'm at a stage now, do I really need to do that? Yeah, I still need to do it because I wouldn't feel comfortable not trying to learn something new, you know, over a period of time. If, if you could, since you've been a guidance counselor, mm-hmm. were you able to share that with students at that time? Or now that you look back on it, would you do that differently? Based yeah, on what? I, Go ahead. Yeah, I think I would. Um, I, I think, you know, I come from a Caribbean household that is very like, you know, doctor, lawyer, yeah, um, professional, yeah, professional, yeah. Um, yeah. nothing in the creative space. Yeah. But being around a lot of creatives and seeing um, what creatives bring to the world, I would encourage more kids to follow um, mm. whatever their dreams were, whatever they are interested in, whatever you find a passion for, whatever you can work on for hours and not feel like you're working. Exactly. You know, those are the things that you will eventually um, do very well at and you'll grow at very easily. Because if yeah. you can wake up every morning and it doesn't feel like like work, <laughs> like you're going to work but you're going to do something that you love and you're passionate about. Yeah. Um, you know, you can get up every day. And I think um, you hear a lot of people speak about success being successful, but very few people talk about being happy. And to me, yeah. that's the ultimate goal is yeah. like, are you happy? You know, yeah. so is making a million dollars going to make you happy or can you make $75,000 a year and be ecstatic and love life every day? <laughs> So yeah. that's the, the, you know, that's the decision to, um, to make. And mm-hmm. I think that's more important than just looking at careers from just a career standpoint and yeah. the prestige that comes along with it. Yeah. Know? The job, the job, I have the job, you know, mm-hmm. in doing that. So the, my, my test is Monday morning. Do you enjoy Monday? So, you know, when I do a session, I'll ask people, how many people know what TGIF means? Everybody says that. How many people feel the same way? And you say TGIM. And all of a sudden, when I said TGIF, all the hands in the room will go up. And then when I say TGIM, it comes down like, and they're looking around at each other because then they're just going through a process. Right. Yeah. I think, um, and I, I, I think there's this attitude, especially in America, that um, money's the ultimate goal, like, yeah. and happiness isn't. And I think a lot of people sacrifice their happiness. And eventually their health and a lot of other things for, you know, an occupation and a career. And I think that's um, that's something I, I would encourage, ki- you know, if I was still counseling kids and I tell, you know, even the youth I run into today, like that shouldn't be your goal. Like happiness should always be your goal. You know, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, just being around um, like my mom's in her 80s. So I've been around a lot of older people in the last couple of years. And I noticed that the ones that are just like happy, their health is great. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. their health is great. They, you know, they still have Mentally, a vision for life. Yeah. 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 But you could see the people who, you know, just worked till they couldn't work anymore. And now, you know, they don't have any, they don't have the time left anymore. Yeah. You know? I, I saw a, a, a data point that said you work say 50 years to enjoy 10. Right. You know, right. and that was 10 depending upon how you did the 50, the 10 could be probably the worst part of your, your life. And it's almost at the end. Mm-hmm. I, I think I, I worked for a company and we adopted a high school. And I think I told you that this was at, when I was at Martha Stewart and we had a, we adopted a high school and our CE, C, chief design officer gave the commencement address. And I was sitting next to a parent who was basically in tears. And she told me the story of how her son wanted to become an artist. He wanted to become a creative. And she's telling him, go to school to become a school teacher because you'll have a job for life. Mm -hmm. And when this chief design officer told her story as to how she was told the same thing and she rebelled and she was glad she rebelled because she's doing what she wanted to do. The lady was telling me how that speech changed her entire thought on pushing her son towards something that she felt mm-hmm. was going to work for him. And I think lots of times we as parents may do that, and specifically in school systems. Yeah, I, I, I try not to. Um, 
I try to let my kids be themselves and I try not to make them, I think as a parent, you think you're good. So you try to make your kids like you. Yeah. And I had to learn that like, and, and it's more in recent years, I'm like, you know, they're going to be their own people, especially my son who, you know, your sons mimic you. So you want them to be like you, but I still need to let all of him to be him, mm. um, encourage him in the things that he wants to, um, we wants to do and guide him in the things that I may see him doing wrong, but ultimately let him be himself and let him explore um, mm. those things. And, you know, if he tells me, you know, I want to be a gamer. And then I said, oh, that's stupid. But then I look up how much gamers make. And I'm yeah. like, oh, my goodness, these yeah. guys make so much money. Like, you know, and it's this kid playing games on YouTube and the kids are watching him. He's a millionaire. And I'm like, oh, OK, they figured it <laughs> <Yeah>. out. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. they figured out I can play games all day and be a millionaire. Mm. So there's um, there's very few things, I think, in today's world where you can make a career out of it. Like we've seen it. You know, and people make careers during the pandemic from their couch. <laughs> so um, yeah. Uh, yeah. I think, you know, I think we should encourage them. I think we should, um, you know, just be there as a support system and not necessarily a dream crusher. Like, yeah. I don't like I think we we definitely grew up in a generation of dream crushers. It was just mm -hmm. like, you know, you Ooh. should be this, <laughs> you know, you should be, you, you know, know you what? should you be this. <laughs> <laughs> you're just laying so many nuggets here man dream crusher whoa have i heard that before? no do exercise think of a dream crusher who do you think of and you can always take two or three mm -hmm. people who always talk oh that's not gonna work you need to you need to get back to reality you need to do this you need I like yeah that. yeah yeah i mean you know especially grow up in a black community it's kind of like we had sports entertainment or you just did good in school yeah. You know, but there was nothing really in that creative space, nothing that was kind of off the radar, or off mm. the cuff, anything different like that was never encouraged. Mm. You know, um, I, I think, you know, entrepreneurship is big now, but I think when we were growing up, it wasn't like a big thing. Like nobody was thinking, um, you know, I'm going to go start, you know, a T-shirt yeah. company or a sneaker company yeah. or yeah. this kind yeah. of company. Like yeah. now, I think that's a lot more in kids thought process because they see a lot of other kids doing it yeah um especially from a young age but i think that encouragement is good because it kind of um it brings competition and a little equity back into the system mm. you know when you find people and everybody's kind of doing something different yeah. and you have a bunch of creators i think that really helps to shape the world and mm. you know make the world because i think with creatives it, it crosses all race and economic uh, boundaries. You yeah. know, when creatives come together, they're just creatives. You know, yeah. um, when a bunch of photographers get together in a room, we're all just photographers. Yeah. Like, yeah. you know, it's it's something that, um, and especially when everybody's looking to learn from each other, like mm -hmm. all the race, economic, all, all that stuff that it's prejudice is kind of goes out the window. And that's yeah. one thing I love about creatives. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> the most racist person probably likes, you know, yeah. a black person's music. <laughs> yeah. Just, yeah. You know, it kind of those kind of things kind of and I think we need to look at that and see why is that, you know, mm. why is it that that kind of like can make people put all their biases to the mm. side for that, you know? Well, you know, I think there's lessons for parents to understand. I think there's lessons for for schools to understand of this new I, I'm going to say the new cu cu customer that's coming into the pipeline of school. And I think schools are still educating people the way that they educated people years ago. And mm -hmm. they're not stepping back to say, if we looked at a company and your, your customer mix had sh shifted, you would adjust to that. Mm -hmm. In a lot of cases, schools and university is still kind of putting everybody through that factory line, the producing stamping, and it moves on from there. Uh, and yeah. that creates a lot of distrust. If these people get out inside of an organization and they all of a sudden they're a boss and all mm -hmm. of those insecurities and all those things kind of pop back because they don't enjoy what they're doing and it just created a distrustful workplace culture and all those kinds of things. Yeah, because if you think about it, a school is probably the only institution you can walk into from 100 years ago and it still looks the same. It still looks. It still has. It still has the same format. 
everything is pretty much the same. If you went to school 100 years ago and you went to school today, it would probably you could probably just jump right into the system. Yeah. Yeah. There'll be nothing different. But that's probably one of the only things. Yeah. Like hospitals have advanced, like everything else has advanced. Mm. But um, schools, for some reason, were still still stuck, still stuck. Yeah. And it's not like um, we're doing an amazing, it, it, like it's an amazing job that's being done. So why fix it? Like we've all, we all have um, examples of what we would like to see done better in school systems, mm -hmm. but we're still doing it the same way. Yeah. Yeah. It's group thing, you know, that because we've always done it that way. I, I, I read an article the other day that said the most dangerous words inside of any organization or for any person for growth is the statement that, we've always done it this way and there's no need to change and do that. And when you do that, that's kind of a recipe for a nosedive, mm -hmm. you know, um, that's going to come about, you know, as a result of that. Um, so photography, you know, you said self-educate on YouTube because I use YouTube. I use YouTube all the time when there's something I'm trying to understand. I don't care what it is. If you search on YouTube, there mm -hmm. is something there that relates to that that's going to enable you to accomplish what you want to accomplish. So you said that photography is a hobby, and then you self-educated, and you were able to learn the basics of photography and to build that business off of, of, off of using that platform? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, well, one thing you'll learn, well, one thing I learned about the photography business is that it has very little to do with photography. <laughs> like, really? There, there's, there's a lot more business that goes into it than actual taking of pictures. So you'll see um, a lot of very successful people who have photography businesses that aren't the best photographers. And you see the best photographers that don't make any money. Okay. So that's one thing I had to learn. And I think that's one kind of thing that I warn people who are going into creative spaces is that you're definitely going to do a business and everything you you need to know everything about doing business and I find creatives um, get in trouble with money especially people who are making a lot of money mm -hmm. and they don't know their numbers so that's one thing I had to learn and that's why okay. I was able to build my business because you have to understand you know the business side. Uh, the business side. The business side is bigger than the photography side. Like uh, okay. the photography part, you can kind of learn that in a few days. Yeah. <laughs> but the business <laughs> aspect of it is kind of like that um that continuing education. Like you have to keep, you know, you have to stay up. You mm -hmm. know, I, I have to, you know, be aware of okay, they changed the tax laws. So now I have to charge sales tax or I'm getting taxed. Like all that stuff is cutting into okay. your profits. Okay. But okay. If you're not worried about the business, you won't have a business. Okay. <laughs> you know, so I think, um, you know, the, and I think that's where people get in trouble with the, you know, it's the music business, you know, and you hear all the horror stories about people who end up broke because they never thought about the business yeah. aspect of it. So they, they, didn't, they didn't look at it as this two faceted business side and then there's a creative side. Mm -hmm. So it's it's different doing being a photographer and having a photography business. And mm. that's something I had to learn, um, mm. you know, in knowing that that's when you can, you know, have longevity in the craft. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you know, you, you had a role as a guidance counselor. And I've, 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 I've always said that a guidance, guidance counselor in a high school, mm -hmm. in a school system, is probably one of the most important jobs because a lot of households that are sending kids to schools, specifically in it, probably in inner cities, that's a, that could be a great sounding board that can turn someone's life around. Mm -hmm. You know, someone having that faith in them to move them forward. There's a gentleman I interviewed a long t uh, last year sometime and he's a he's a medical doctor he's an mba and he said there was one teacher that told him that he had a lot to offer and kind of coached him throughout his career now he was just online the other other day he just got his uh appointment to do his residency at the school of choice and it was an amazing story he used to be a security guard oh wow at a hospital and he asked doctors, could he shadow them? And all the doctors said, security, no, get away from me. 
And there was one doctor who said, sure. He did the paperwork and he shadowed him around and piqued his interest in education. And it kind of changed his life. So we talk about in our lives, impacts that we can make. And I, so I go back to you as that guidance counselor. If you could speak at a guidance counselor convention, what are some things that you would tell them about their craft that maybe they are not, they don't understand from the real world? Yeah, I, I think one thing um, that I had to realize and that I always tell people, never underestimate how much you mean to somebody else. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, just like with you, um, I told you my story yeah. and that got me on this show, yeah. <laughs> you know, but yeah. it's it's sharing my story and, you know, that ultimately set off something in your mind and, you know, said that, oh, your story can help other people. So let me bring you on your show, on my show. So you can, you know, eventually help other people. And I think that's the thing we can't underestimate ourselves Mm -hmm. and especially working with youth. um, We're very, very influential. Mm -hmm. You know, we can all go back to that teacher who we loved and who gave us those golden nuggets that we carry with us today and the ones who really beat us down. Mm-hmm. that kind of gave us those insecurities and, you know, told us we couldn't do this or do that. Mm-hmm. So I think we can't underestimate um, like a guidance counselor or any um, body who's in that educational space. You can't underestimate um, the power that you have and the influence that you have. Mm-hmm. Um, and you can really do some amazing things with not too much effort, but just being mindful of, the information and what you're putting out there to these kids Mm -hmm. because kids are very influential and they're looking for the answers, you know, even though they act like they know it all, they're really looking for it. Yeah, Yeah, I got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're crying in a corner someplace, you know, uh, as a result of that. So you mentioned that, you know, um, the impact it's had on people's lives. When I do leadership development, that's a breakout session that we do. And I ask everyone to think back in your life of someone who made a difference and made an impression upon you. And you still carry that to this day. Mm-hmm. And here's what I found as many times as I've done that across the world, it's never a manager. It's never some high big shot. It's, it could have been the janitor that they sat down and had a conversation with. It could be the guidance counselor. They could be that one teacher that kind of stuck with them as Dr. Russell talked through his story that made an impression. So when you talk about how impressionable we as people could have on kids, I think everyone needs to understand that a little more and your interactions could be powerful. Is that a pretty good assessment? Yeah, I think it's really, it's a really good assessment. I think people, people don't remember what you did for them. People remember how you made them feel. So like if you can make somebody feel empowered, if you can make somebody feel loved, those things, I think that's what we carry with us, you know, to our old age. And those people that you were talking about who people are reflecting about, it's not so much what they did to them, did for them. It's kind of how they made them feel, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. So it's the way that those people influenced us by the feeling they gave us, the you know, what they told us made us feel empowered or made us feel like, oh yeah, we can do this or made us feel loved. Mm -hmm. Like those small things that you, well, things that we think are small are very easy to give to people are very impactful. Yeah. You know, more than, yeah, yeah, more than any kind of money, any kind of scholarship or anything. I don't remember people who, the scholarships that I got when I went to school, Yeah, Yeah. but I remember the people who, who got me there. Yeah. Yeah. you know, who, um, who showed me love, who, you know, or, and sometimes it was even tough love. Right. Mm. And yeah. sometimes I didn't understand why it was so hard on me, mm. but mm. you know, later on, I'm like, Oh, I, now I know why, you know, mm. those are probably the people that cared about me the most. Yeah. You know, yeah. the people who would not let me fail, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, yeah. so one, one gentleman told a story, you know, based on what you were just saying about how as a child, uh, his babysitter was his grandfather. And his grandfather was the CEO of a company. So the parents would drop him off every day. And the grandfather wanted him to sit next to him in every meeting, every big meeting, every business discussion, he sat next to him. 
And he said, just watch and listen. And at the end of the meeting, he'd sit there and take the time to go through and explain everything that was happening in that meeting. And he said it was the most profound education as a kid. He said that was an MBA in real life because yeah. of the grandfather that was babysitting that you never would have thought that, you know, in a lot of cases, he would have said, OK, here's some toys over here. Stay in this room until your parents come back. <laughs> Yeah. And meanwhile, he was getting the education that he could not have bought. He said, my MBA is great, but what I learned from that old man and the time he took for me, I learned life about caring for people, spending time and just understanding the business side. Yeah. So similar, similar but different situation. My dad used to um, was in real estate and he um, used to flip houses. So yeah. he would, you know, wrangle us in the morning and take us with him to work on these houses. I yeah. hated it. You know, imagine a kid in the summer, you know, you're in like fourth, fifth grade and you're going to like do sheetrock, like, yeah. you know, but <laughs> you know, over COVID I remodeled my basement myself, uh -huh. you know? So it's like those <laughs> skills. And also it taught me to see, see the beauty in something that's not there. Mm -hmm. Right. Because you go and you got a house, it's a mess. Yeah. You know, but you have to see the vision of what this could possibly be. Mm -hmm. So seeing houses from, you know, gutted to, you know, dilapidated to remodeled, it's like, oh, OK. Yeah. You know, I can yeah. see the big it teaches you. It taught me to see the bigger picture and things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it gave me the ability to work with my hands, which has helped me tremendously, uh, you know, yeah. throughout my life. Yeah. You know, so, you know, it's. I think it's that tough love. Like we, uh, like me and my brothers hated it, you know, but you know, those skills that I learned yeah, yeah. Um, are invaluable to me now. Like I use them every day. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know? So my, my story was similar to that. My father owned a taxi company. Mm -hmm. And when I got my driver's license, so excited about having a driver's license, I said, I'll take over your, all of your early morning trips. This was way before Uber and all of this. So he had customers who had to be to work at say 5 30 6 o'clock they worked in shifts in factories and i'd get up in the morning 4 45 5 o'clock and i'd drive these people to work or whatever it was you've got to be there on time make sure you're there if you're not on time all these kinds of things and i did that until i didn't want to do it anymore and i went back to him and i said i've done it enough now because i want to go back to real life i don't want to get up that early he said doesn't work that way in life he said you made an agreement we shook hands on it you're going to do that until i say you don't need to do it anymore. What I learned from that, being on time, I learned from that uh, uh, being able to uh, understand your responsibilities and what you have to do. And you get up early in the morning. Even to this day, I still get up for the most part around 4.45 in the morning. And, and that came from just a little high school thing and right. took it on into life, you know, in knowing that. So all of these learnings come about as a result and it, so and when we come back to why I wanted you here, because when you told me the story, you were sh shooting photos of me and I was going through my little posing and I put Mr. Fork. <laughs> so let me give the audience a story. So yeah. I wanted to get in kind of in the mood. So not only people would put on music, I put on Richard Pryor because he's <laughs> a funny amazing. guy. And Devon said, okay, first time, that'll go down in the history books, but that's the first time anybody <laughs> ever put on Pryor to get into that kind of mood you know, in doing that. But, you know, so as we talk through, you know, these kind of approaches and life and all these kind, there's so much that people can learn from just noticing what's going on around you. Yeah. And it's just like with you, um, it's you come into my studio, it's about you, right? And it's about what's going to make you comfortable and what's going to make you ultimately give you that expression that you have in your pictures like that's a genuine smile yeah. but you know i'm not that funny richard Pry is <laughs> so he's yeah. gonna get that smile yeah. out of you that yeah. Yeah. And, you know we we laugh together and we talked and you know ultimately for me it's that exchange that um you know got you to the the point where you could give me the expression that's gonna be, give you that winning smile that Everybody's yeah. going to see a picture and be like, oh, that's a great picture because you really look happy. And it, it, because at that moment, you really were. And that's one thing that I kind of pride myself on and try to teach is that, you know, 
photography is more than just a great technical picture. Like the greatest pictures aren't that technical. Okay. It's more about, you know, especially in portrait photography, it's about the connection you have with the subject and that yeah. expression that the subject is yeah. going to give you. Because yeah. you can see a lot of people who are quote unquote great photographers, but everybody in their pictures look like they don't want to be there. Yeah, so they, <laughs> and, and it's kind of a forced thing. And mm -hmm. see, that's what I was worried about. But your technique, you you distracted because you were talking, talking, telling the stories, and we were chatting back and forth. But meanwhile, you were shooting, and mm -hmm. you were doing this. You were adjusting like you still kept the conversation going. And I have never, ever, as long as I've been on social, I think I was up to like 2,000 likes when I changed that photo. And I'm like, oh, my God. I mean just from a photo shoot, you know, and you were the maestro. Yeah, it's because it's, um, well, and, and that's one thing when you talk about photography and the photography business, it's like, what's going to separate me from the other guy that knows all the technical aspects of light? Because we can both learn that. Okay. I mean, my only up is my interaction and people giving me something different than they would mm -hmm. give to somebody else. Mm -hmm. And that to me is the, the winning you know, so if I can give you a picture that you're, you know, you love and you're like, hey, that that's what I was going for. Okay. Then, you know, I did. A, I did an excellent job for you. Yeah. And that's ultimately what it is. It's like doing an excellent job. But usually that comes from the interaction, because as a photographer, from a technical aspect, I could set up the lights and I could take a great technical picture of you. But you know, you're going to look like you don't want to be there. <laughs> yeah. You know? well, it's going to be the, it's going to be the school. a gun to me and I'm sitting right. here looking like it's the lineup. The, <laughs> right. But the, the lighting could be impeccable and all these other aspects can be great. But, you know, it's that interaction, me figuring out, okay, what's going to make you comfortable? So ultimately you forget that I'm taking pictures. Yeah. Right. So it's me talking to you. It's me letting you listen to what you want to listen to. Yeah. Right. And yeah. you chose, you know, you chose Richard Pryor where I thought, man, this is and, and I learned something for you. Maybe we should just listen to Conomy albums if we need a big smile. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? I, I tell I told my daughter Lauren that story. She said, Dad, no, you didn't. I said, Yep, I did. You know how I am. I, that's exactly <laughs> what I did in doing that. So let's take a commercial break and then we're gonna come back and uh dig a little deeper into this. So we're gonna go to commercial break now. Do you have an all-star HR team? You may feel your team is already performing at a high level, but let's take a closer look. Would your company's top leaders and employees agree that your HR team are operating at a high level? Are team members able to influence top executives on difficult topics? Are team members business and strategy focused on the challenges the organization is facing? Does the executive team trust your direct reports as advisors on human capital issues? If you can answer yes to these questions, you have built an outstanding team. If you feel there is room for improvement, Strategy Focused Group can create a custom development program to elevate the quality of your HR team. We use HCI certification programs as well as non-certified HRBP MBA master class to give your team a laser focus on the business and strategy. Please email us at info at strategyfocusedgroup.com. One of the key points you <clears throat> you mentioned before we went on break was that the relationship that you have with your clients. When I got there, you you basically I'm going to say distracted me, and we just started talking about something else, and I wasn't mentally aware that you were shooting photos because we just kept talking and you kept engaging in conversation, and it kind of changed the the final product, you know, as a result of that. So is that a if is that a technique that, because I do a lot of leadership development, that, and one of the things I talk about is, <clears throat> is building a relationship, one-on-one -on -one relationship with each individual you work for. And you create that environment. You know, you created a creative environment. I could create an environment inside of an organization between, if I've got 10 people reporting to me, each one, I kind of figure out that soft, some may like Mr. Price, some may like something else in doing that. Can you give us, 
How did you arrive at that way of doing that? Because maybe when you first started out, you were just getting in front and just shooting the pictures. Was that a learning? Yeah, that's definitely a learning um, learning experience. Because for me, I figured out that people, when people are comfortable, they look like themselves. Mm -hmm. And that's, it sounds weird, but that's one of the hardest things to get people to do as a photographer is get them to relax so that they look like themselves yeah. because they all feel like, I come up to a photo shoot, I have to pose. So, yeah. you know, I don't know what they've seen on America's Next Top Model or whatever they've, they've seen. They, they yeah. all think it's going to be this um, big to do. And yeah, yeah, they're, 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 they're coming ready for all of that, yeah. you know, and I think yeah. getting them to relax and getting them to enjoy the process because one thing I, I learned that I had to do as a photographer is I usually, when I set up the lights and stuff, I come stand where you're going to stand. I, you did so that, I yeah. could see how it's going to feel to you, mm -hmm. right? Because it's, you know, it's intimidating to just have this camera pointed at you and I'm just taking pictures because you're getting your head like, how do I look? And yeah. I look crazy? Because yeah. like, nobody wants to look bad. Yeah. <laughs> right? yeah. So yeah. getting you to talk and us having a conversation it, it, it does distract you, but ultimately it's getting, it's distracting you so that you get comfortable and you're relaxed, yeah. Yeah. you know? So, and we can work together. So, you know, when you come in, I'm a little uncomfortable because I don't know you. Mm -hmm. So we're warming up to each other, but yeah. it's a quick, you know, it has, it's kind of a quick warm up, right? Because it's, okay. you know, so I have to find out, I start talking to asking questions because I'm finding out how can we connect? Yeah. You know, and usually you can connect with somebody on some level, you know, I mean, Richard Pryor is an easy connection. I mean, you made it, you made it super easy, but you know, but we talked about more things and I usually, yeah. you know, I usually just ask people about themselves, you know, that's the easiest topic for people to talk about is yeah. themselves. So, you know, ask them about work. If they don't go too into work, then I know work's not that important to them. I mean, ask them about their family usually between work family um hobbies like there's something that somebody is into mm -hmm. that they're passionate about that they want to talk about you know and we just talk about it and that yeah. is enough to um get them yeah. to relax yeah yeah you know? because when i parked my car and i was walking around i missed the building and i saw you standing there and, and you brought me in and i walked in your massive studio and i see all these lights and i see where i'm supposed to stand you know I'm very comfortable in front of an audience, but I was going like, okay, how is this going to go? How, <laughs> how am I going to be able to sit here and don't look like as if I'm in a lineup for a police shoot or something like that. <laughs> and, um, and then you just kind of took over and we started talking and all of a sudden that fear kind of dissipated, but you created the aura. And mm -hmm. I think that's what I was getting at. So for leaders to create an aura in a group that people feel comfortable you know, and offering up ideas, regardless of what that idea may be. Yeah, I think the, 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 the term for it is called psychological safety, which is mm -hmm. what you created in that time that we were together. Yeah. And I think um, when you, when you're the photographer or whether I'm teaching a, a workshop or a class or I'm the photographer in a session, you set the tone. You know, and I find like, um, and it's just like if you were in a classroom situation or anything else, you know, you have to set the tone of what this is going to be. Because I find like when people walk into a photo studio, they all have these preconceived notions about what it's going to be like. Yeah. You know, like you did, like, you you know, your heart started yeah. beating. It's just like, okay, uh, you know, <laughs> and but on the flip side is everybody wants to do a good job. Yeah. Yeah. But when you set the tone and you let them know, like, hey this is going to be a, a chill thing because the first thing I said is what music do you want to listen to? Yeah. Right. So I'm empowering you to take some control over the session, yeah. you know? So you feel like, oh, okay, this guy's going to listen to whatever I want to listen to. This is cool. And, and most people will say the typical response is, and I think you said the same thing. Oh, we can listen to anything. Yeah. You know? And then you were like, you know what? Let me see if I can listen to some prior. Yeah. <laughs> That'll get me to smile because you saw the smile you were giving me and you're like, this isn't it, you know, and yeah. let me see if I can listen to some prior. And yeah. that yeah. it was that little thing. But, you know, I think it was me setting the tone of just asking you, what do you want to listen to? That made you comfortable saying, hey, yeah. yeah, you know, can we listen to some prior? So I think as a leader, as the owner of a business, you know, you're going to be working with a team, you're going to be working with clients. I think you need to set the tone um, 
of what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. Mm -hmm. Also, um, just kind of setting boundaries is important too. And, um, but ultimately setting a safe space for everybody to work because I think people do their best when they're comfortable and they feel yeah. safe. Yeah. Yeah. So when a client comes in, so you may have one client that's engaging and you may have one client that's there and want to do this and they never partially come out of that fear of this camera in front of them. What other techniques do you use to and maybe I don't respond to the questions that, you know, sometimes you interview people and you ask a question, they give you a one sentence answer. Mm -hmm. Is it difficult people or? Yeah, I think that you, you run into those people. Um, you, you know, and usually like, that's why I usually shoot um, tethered to the computer. So as I'm shooting, they're coming onto the computer. So I can automatically go around and say, hey, why don't you come look at what we're getting? Okay. And usually people will see either either to see a picture and they'll love it and they'll get super happy and they'll get super yeah. cocky. Like, Oh, I look amazing. Like, you know, <laughs> let's keep I, going. I kind of did that when I look like, Oh, that's pretty cool. I don't know how to do that. You know? <laughs> or they'll see that um, they do look um, uncomfortable and they'll want to change that, mm -hmm. you know, cause mm -hmm. they don't want to look uncomfortable. So they're like, oh, okay, maybe let me loosen up. Let me, um, you know, so just, doing things visually, um, usually for most people, just figuring out what they want to talk about. Okay. You know, most okay. people um, want to talk about something and some people just need to like physically like shake their body off. Yeah. Like they're just stiff and usually telling them to let go of whatever is in their head, <laughs> you know, because yeah. I found like a lot of people come in and they have a lot of baggage and they just need to leave all that to the side for, you know, give me five minutes. Yeah. You know? Leave the luggage, leave the luggage over here. We're gonna yeah. Give me different. five yeah. minutes. Let it go. Um, another technique I let them do is um, I let them make silly faces. For some reason, this always works. Okay. Like just give me some silly face. Give me some silly poses. Like do like whatever you want to do, like okay. do some silly things mm -hmm. and then come back. And then they usually give me the best relaxed expression. Okay. Cause it's okay. just a way of, letting go of yeah because i mean we we live in a society where there's so much noise yeah. you know our phones go off every two seconds with yeah. alerts and we're getting worldwide news and you know social media and we have all this information that's always hitting us so there's a lot of noise in our head and sometimes you need to help people just just let that go for a minute mm -hmm. and just be in this space right now be present and when people are able to do that i usually get great results from them Okay. But, you know, you, you have some tough people that just will not yeah. loosen up, you yeah. know, yeah. and as and as a photographer, you have to realize that yeah. Yeah. it's not me, it's them, you know, yeah. and, yeah. you know, I'm doing everything I could possibly do. Um, it, it, it's not me, it's them. So you have to be, a, and I think that's in business. Sometimes you're going to get that tough client and no matter how you try to appease them, yeah. what accommodations you make. Mm -hmm. it's not you, it's them. You're doing a good job. Yeah. You know, you do a good job. You've done excellent work for, you know, you have a whole client list. Yeah. Don't let this one person bring you down and think you're not good at what you do because you are, mm -hmm. you know, they're just a bad client. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, everybody's of, not your client. Yeah. You know, with that's a lot, of, I have to with a lot of luggage. They, they with with a lot of luggage, you know, they, they, that they baggage that they're carrying yeah. is yeah. not part of what yeah. you do. So, yeah. you know, they need help with that. So, you so for people that's listing USA bound kind of people, how do you, how would they get in touch with you? Your website or yeah. So the the best way to reach me is um, through my website. It's Devon Warren Photo, um, D E V O N W A R R E N F O T O at um, dot com. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Cool. And you're on Instagram too. You on yeah. All so the to say Devon Warren Photo at Devon Warren Photo for all. Um, for all social media. So Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, okay, everything. So yeah, Devon Warren Photo. So that's F-O-T-O. Okay. Okay, cool. Devon, my man, thank you so much for taking thank the time this morning you. and ha you know having you here as a guest. And I knew it was going to be cool. I know there was going to be a lot of learning that came from it. And you brought the A-game to the session today. So just hang on as we close out. Definitely. Thank you. Okay.